Okay. I think it's on. Uh, thank you if you'll just share that out to everyone else. Uh, here we are again. You know, this morning I was uh, up. I had been watching the weather all this time. I've been wondering, uh, are we going to even be able to have services here today? Are we going to be able to be able to meet? Is God going to move the clouds and uh, cause the thunderstorms to move on down the road? And thank God he did, didn't he? he? He prepared a way for us to be here this morning. He did that. He did that. There was nothing I could have done to make this occur, but God did that. And I'm forever thankful to that because this, what we do here, isn't just a, a ritual, a thing that we do every Sunday. I think that is probably the thing that we have got stuck in our minds, that this is just something that we go do. It's kind of like going to school or going to work. No, we are coming here today to do something that people have done for going on now 2,000 years. They have met groups all over the world in memorial, looking forward to the return of Jesus Christ someday. They're prepared for what is occurring. This is not just some uh, simple thing that we do. We are coming to the church, God's house, and the church is coming to God's house, right? And we are the church. And this is kind of like an, a memorial, a memorial that we do every Sunday. You know, Memorial Day weekend is this week, and um, the definition of a memorial is an object which serves as a focus for the memory or the commemoration of something, usually an influential deceased person or a historical tragic event. That's why I say we're meeting here because what happens on Sunday? There's a lot of controversy about Sunday and the day of worship. Can I tell you why we meet on Sunday? Because that's the day the Lord rose from the grave, right? We celebrate this day. It is a memorial to our God and all that he has done for us. And Memorial Day, as we know it, is a federal holiday in the United States uh, for honoring and mourning the military personnel who had died while serving the United States. You know, usually at Veterans Day, we raise our hands and we say, well, who all has served, right? And we're very thankful for all those who have served. But Memorial Day, they can't raise their hands, can they? No, no, they died. And we're remembering those who passed away uh, in, in order for us to see our freedoms, to, to have that. Um, one of the greatest memorials that I personally have ever seen is Arlington National Cemetery. Has anybody ever been there at Arlington? Raise your hand there. If you're online, just, just uh, raise your hand online, you know. Arlington. I, we have walked through there, and as you walk through and you see those white marble tombstones simply laid out, and they go on forever and ever all around you, all the different, uh, everywhere you look. There's a different white marble tombstone around you. And each one of those people are a soul that died in order for us to continue this nation. They died for us. I mean, we don't see that every day. It's a sobering event to walk up to Arlington National Cemetery and walk through that graveyard and see all of that history and all of that memorial about what, what God has provided in the death of these people that we be able to have our freedoms here in America. Memorials are an important thing. Meeting here today is an important thing. We need reminders of important things. The most important thing to the Christian should be that Jesus rose from the grave, right? The most important thing is that that Jesus rose from that grave. He came, he died for our sins, and he rose again. And we tend to get caught up in the common things of life and forget that what has come before has made us who we are now. You know, uh, this isn't a common church service, isn't it? You know, I, I think all of this, this COVID-19 and all these different things has been a warning sign to us, maybe to shake us up and begin to make us Think about how important it is to come to church, to worship in God's house, to meet with the, the brothers and sisters, to come together and give praise to Almighty God for all the good things that He's done for us because we get so caught up in the normal day today that we forget how important it is 
that we know Jesus is our Savior and Lord. That we are part of something bigger than the rest of this world. That we are, are part of something bigger than all of the universe. We are part of God's family, right? Can there be any greater thing to hold up in a memorial? I, I hope you brought your Bibles today. I know it's not a conventional service, but I do hope you brought your Bibles. And if you have, if you'll turn in your Bibles to Joshua, Joshua chapter 4. Joshua chapter 4. In Joshua chapter 4, God makes a memorial for His people. His people have uh, been uh, carried off, right? They were down in Egypt for a long, long time. They were down there and they, they grew into a mighty nation. Uh, the Jewish people did. And while they were there, uh, they were enslaved by the Egyptian people. And the Egyptian people held them in bondage until God sent a man named Moses who would lead his people out of bondage, right? We know this. Why do we know this? Because we sit, we've studied over it in God's house, right? We've studied over it from the Word of God. This has been passed on from generation to generation to generation that we might have this memorial that we meet each Sunday, right? God has provided that for us that we know. So, so here we see, now Moses has passed away. They have been wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. Why? Because they rejected the plan of God that they might go ahead and go on into the promised land. They were uh, afraid. They didn't want to go on in to the promised land because they were afraid that, that the, uh, something might get them. They were afraid of that and uh, of the people there. And God said, well, if you don't trust me, I'm just going to make you wander around for 40 more years out in the wilderness. But at the end of that, he calls a man named Joshua after Moses has passed away. And as they're getting ready to head over into this land, He's going to make a memorial for his people, a reminder of what he has done for them. Um, and God knows that, uh, that what they want, they are there, they will have this tendency to forget who they are and how they got there. You know, that's why, uh, well, that's why I'm going to read this here in just a minute, but that's why he wants to make this memorial, because we need these, we need an event during the week to make us remind us that Jesus came to die for our sins. Sometimes we need one on Wednesday night too, don't we? We need these events to keep us of a reminder of who we are and what God has called us to do. And this reminder will point back to them. You know, as we've been going through this COVID-19 crisis, I've made a point to come here each Sunday to this very place. And I've made a point to turn the camera wherever you've been watching it uh, onto the crosses behind me. I, I made a point for you to see a pulpit. I've made a point for you to see this building behind me because this place is a memorial. It's a place we come to to worship Almighty God. It reminds us of who we are. I don't know about you, but I felt the loss of our fellowship during this time. It wasn't a small matter for me to come down here to broadcast. I could have broadcast in my basement. I could have put on my t-shirt. I mean, I could have done all these different things, but people need to see that the people of God are meeting in some capacity, even in the greatest crises that we have seen in our lifetime. We need this. Our gathering place reminds us that we are part of something bigger in this world. It's important. And this is what God wanted for his people too in Joshua 4 when they were going into their meeting place, when they were going into the, the promised land once again. God wanted a place that they could identify as their own. And now we see after thousands of years of history, I've been talking with Josiah about that this week when we've been studying over history and different things in his schooling, uh, that, um, that the Jewish people have come back to this promised land once again, haven't they, in 1948. But I want you to open up your Bible, Joshua chapter 4, in verse 1. Let's read the, uh, the Word of God. Before we do, let's call out to our God in prayer. Lord Jesus, we call out to you this morning. We ask God that you would just provide for us a blessing here. Lord, we thank you. You have provided the sunlight. Lord, I sat and I worried and I whined and I, I said, God, are you going to cause the lightning storm to be down here today when we have to stand outside? And you said, and you came. You answered my prayer, God. 
You allowed for us to have sunlight here today that we might meet with the people of God, even in this capacity, that we might come together to glorify your holy name up upon this hill, that the people out among us will know that we have come to worship you and lift you up because you are more important than we ever were. We thank you, God, for that. I ask you, Lord, just to give me your simple message here today. You've showed it to me already, but I can't deliver it without your power. And I ask, Lord Jesus, that you might give me the strength the wisdom, the words, that I might speak boldly for you here this morning, that your people may know that there is a God in heaven, and he is worthy of all worship. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' blessed name, amen. Amen. Joshua chapter 4. And it came to pass, when all the people were clean passed over Jordan, that the Lord spake unto Joshua, saying, Take you twelve men out of the people, out of every tribe a man, and command ye them, saying, Take you hence out of the midst of Jordan, out of the place where the priest's feet stood firm, twelve stones, and ye shall carry them over with you, and leave them in the lodging place where ye shall lodge this night. Then Joshua called the twelve men from whom he had prepared the children of Israel out of every tribe a man. And Joshua said unto them, Pass over before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of Jordan, and take ye up every man of you a stone upon his shoulder according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel. And that this may be a sign among you, that when your children ask their fathers in times to come, what mean ye by these stones? Then ye shall answer them, that the waters of Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When it passed over Jordan, the waters of Jordan were cut off, and these stones shall be a memorial unto the children of Israel forever. And the children of Israel did so as Joshua commanded, and took up twelve stones out of the midst of Jordan, as the Lord spake unto the children of Israel, and carried them over with them unto the place where they lodged, and laid them down there. Now, I want you to see here the memorial that is being placed here by God as these stones are being stacked up here. Uh, first of all, there is a memorial here of a reminder of a second chance, right? The reason that God's people had to wait for 40 years to enter into this promised land was because they didn't believe that God was powerful enough to give it to them. They didn't trust their God enough to know that they were able to go back into the promised land, to move on into that place. And he had now he had caused the waters of the Jordan River literally to pile up like a heap so they could walk through the midst of the waters as a sign that God was blessing their journey back their journey into their homeland. You know, this is where Abraham uh, originally came from. And he left there. His people left there and went down to Egypt. Now they're coming back home once again. And, and they didn't believe God was powerful enough to take care of things. And he caused this water to stand up in a heap and allow them to pass. It was a reminder of what he had done for their forefathers, right? When they come out of Egypt, what happened? The Red Sea opened up on both sides and they walked in between that. Now, now you might say, that we have been through the wilderness wandering here ourselves during this COVID-19 crisis. We all got scattered all over the place. Uh, we, we've contacted one another with different broadcasts and different things. But did you ever think that after, at the end of all this that maybe God's given us a second chance? A second chance to get this right. You hear what I'm saying? The reports are coming out all over today that this virus wasn't as bad as people thought it was going to be, right? Y'all have read that. Have you heard that? Yeah, some of you have. Yeah, uh, it, it's come out that this virus wasn't as bad. And some of us may have just thought, well, isn't that good? But I seem to remember there was a time when I stood up here in this pulpit and I said, let's pray. Let's pray for our people that God will watch over us through this crisis. And we, we cried out to God. I hope you did. I cried out to God. I said, God, please don't let this be as bad as they're saying it's going to be. And you know what happened? It ain't as bad as they're saying it's going to be. Amen? Did our God not show up? But did we even recognize it? Did we even understand that he had showed up here for us like this? you believe God heard us? And he's given us a second chance to get this church thing right? To do it the way God wants it to be? To be what God wants us to be in this? Maybe before now you thought, well, I've got forever to step in and do this or that at church. I've got forever that I can go ahead and participate in this particular thing or participate in that particular thing. Friends, we don't have tomorrow. There was a man, and I don't know how much 
credits I put into it. But this man said uh, online, he said, well, you know, uh, this come along and this crisis come along. And he says God gave him a, a vision, he said. Now, I don't know how much you want to put into that. But he said there could be something worse. He believes that God's going to send something worse here later on if we aren't preparing ourselves. Folks, there's a reason that God has caused this to happen in our lives. It's to shake us up. You know, even the restaurants down here. They say because this, all this has happened, they've had to sit back and they had to reevaluate the way they're doing their restaurant business, okay? They've had to sit back and they've had to reevaluate what they're doing. Maybe, church, it's time for us to reevaluate what we're doing and how we're doing it and what we do the best for what God's glory is. Do you hear what I'm saying here today? To be what God wants us to be. It's a reminder. It's a reminder, my friend, of a second chance. And that's what those Israelites had. They had a second chance to go on into the promised land. A second chance. It's also a reminder of who we are. Now, you know, there was a reason why they carried 12 stones across that Jordan and laid them up there, right? There was a reason for it to be 12. There were 12 tribes of Israel here. And each one carried each one of these out of the waters of judgment. And it builds this visual reminder on the other side. Those Jews, the 12 tribes, are God's people. They were not the people who lived in this land. Now the people who lived in this land, they were getting ready under God's direction to go in and wipe them from the land. Because God had given them over 400 years to repent of their sins. I mean, they were very sinful people. The people who were on the other side of this land were people bound up in evil. They had child sacrifice. They would take their children and they would uh, mate with one another so they could create a child just so they could kill it. Just so they could cry out to their gods and, 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 and gain some kind of the reins in their mind that the rain would come if they killed their god. They went up and they would lay uh, these little babies inside the hands of these idols that were uh, set apart on fire. And the fire would get so hot in the hands, they'd lay the baby in there and the baby would literally roast in the hands. You talk about a wicked people killing their babies for their, for their own idea that they might be able to go a little farther out in the world or gain a little bit more money. That was the idea there. Not only did they do that, they were involved in sexual immorality of all types. They were involved with uh, uh, being with animals, and I'm not saying just being in the presence of one, right? They were involved in same sexuality. They were involved in, in, in orgies and all these different wicked and evil things all throughout the culture that was there in those ancient times. Not only that, they were involved in the worship of all different types of gods. All different types, not just one. None of them knew the true God, and none of them wanted to know the true God. Friends, can I tell you something? Today, as I look out over the landscape of our nation, it looks a lot more like the people of Canaan than it looks like the people of God, doesn't it? It looks a lot more like the old wicked Canaanites who God had to judge and send out of the land than it looks like the people of God. Shamefully, the people of God uh, over the centuries would fall into the same attitude as those Canaanites. Maybe here in America today, we're falling into the same attitude as the Canaanites that came before us. Think about it. We've had celebration of abortion up to the very birth of a child. So much so that we want to celebrate it that we, we paint our buildings in pink with light, right? Such a celebration of wickedness right here in our own presence. And yet we quietly just move along and act like that's not a big deal. We see homosexuality marketed to children at the very earliest ages. Turn on your cartoons today. They're marketing the idea of homosexuality to the smallest child. The smallest child in cartoons, in superhero programs. The superheroes are now set aside that they're be involved in same sexuality. And it's encouraged. It's told, oh, be prideful of being out and seeing. Folks, what kind of a culture do we live in here today? I, this is the only place you're going to hear that there's anything wrong with that. Can I tell you that? Only at the churches. Only at the true churches. Some of the churches have went and hid. They don't come out and say anything about such things as this anymore. Why? Because they don't care about people. They care about their sales. They don't want to deal with making the strong arguments for why this is wrong and this is right. They just want them to come in, pay their monies, pay their dues, and go on down to the house 
be happy about themselves and move on. But folks, our God comes to us and He wants to make us better than we are here today. He wants to give us a better life. He doesn't want us to be involved in such things as the worship of Allah and Buddha. And, and this is the main God in America. Can I tell you? In God we trust when we see that on our monies. I, I imagine sometimes that God that we say we put our trust in is really the God of self. Right? The God of self. Isn't that what most people are following today? It is what I think. What I imagine. That's the God that many people are putting their trust in here today. Now. Now, it's sad today. It really is. So far from our forefathers that people don't understand our religious freedoms. We know today that in many places those abortion clinics are being uh, prop, propped up that they may have full capacity business while the churches are being told in some areas of our states that they're not allowed even to open up their doors or even have a drive-in service like we're having here today. Folks, I tell you what, we live in a day and in an age when people have forgotten where they come from and that's why we needed a memorial. We need a memorial of who we are. Now the answer is about how to live in this crisis uh, we knew when this first occurred, it couldn't occur from the world. We had to seek God's word. Even if the, go if the government ever comes in and they tell us we're going to shut our doors, then we've got to weigh out what the Bible says about this. Romans 13 says we should listen to the authorities, right? We should unless the, the authority is higher, and that is God. God has told us that we uh, should uh, forsake not the gathering of ourselves together. That's very clear. I, I think it's from the book of Hebrews off my mind. But he also tells us to love thy neighbor as thyself. And as we evaluated these things and we prayed and we asked God to give us a, an idea of what to do, we realized that's what God would have us to do, is to close the doors and work online and do these different things. But we knew we shouldn't stop from preaching the gospel during this time. Actually, we went online further. I've been able to, to reach people over in, in India, in, in, in England, in all these different places by what God was doing. It's funny, you know. It's like back in the book of Acts when the church was persecuted, they got spread out. You know what that caused? It caused the word of God to go out even farther, didn't it? Isn't our God good? And how he works things out and he puts these things together. And I think, I think that maybe all this has happened in our lifetime to give us a point and a moment to actually think about these things and to remind us that when times go bad, we are still to be the people of God. We are still to be the people of God, presenting the word of God, however possible, whether the people of the land allow it or not. The word of God must go out. The memorial must continue to our Lord Jesus Christ. And finally here, a reminder that God provides. Every time the, the Jewish people would look, at these 12 stones, it was to be a reminder that God had literally stopped the Jordan for them to pass over. Now, I don't see many miracles like that today, do you? I mean, I, I, I've seen some things I thought was a miracle that, that God had done. I've recognized things in my life that God has done for me that I've seen happen over time. But you know something where we have a memorial of miracles of that nature? It's right here in this book, isn't it, church? It's right here in this book. Over and over again, I read within this book that God has provided for his people over and over again. Philippians 4.19, but my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Psalm 81.10 talks about when they were down in Egypt. It says, I am the Lord thy God which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. Open thy mouth wide and I will feel it. Does God not provide what we need? Romans 8.32, he provided our greatest need in the Lord Jesus Christ. It says there, he that spared not his son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Amen. God has provided what we need. Now that's the promises of the book. Now I want. I, now y'all listening, ain't you? I know it's hard to see through them windshields, right? Y'all listening, ain't you? Now listen to this. Look around you. Hasn't God provided for you? Hasn't God provided what you need? All around you? Aren't there little memorials that we see every day that confirms that God has kept us blessed, promises to us, this little congregation? There was a time I've been told that this little congregation, they met uh, far off in a, in a little uh, storefront. They've led a long ways off. 
And then God provided the land. And then God provided the, the building. And then God provided the, the, the way to pay off the building. God has provided so much for us, hasn't he? Over and over and over again. God has given these little things to us here. And God's blessed us through this crisis as well. He's provided the income to pay the bills of this church while many have struggled. I was so blessed. There was a, a lady that had been watching on YouTube and watching the programs and different stuff. She sent in a, a, a tithe on her stimulus check to keep a little church down in White Pine going. She sent a tithe from her stimulus check down here to us. Why? Because we were preaching the Word of God and she wanted to take a part in that memorial to God here at this church. Isn't that a blessing to hear? Isn't it a blessing that God was moving in such a way all across this country? Where have you seen the blessings at in your own home? Are you waking up with all the members of your family? Are you waking up in a nice home? As Pastor Bud used to say, uh, when you go to your closet, there's probably so many clothes in your closet you can't get to them. You're probably complaining that they're wrinkled, right? And here you have more clothes than most of the people in the world ever thought about having. Oh, we focus on the negative, don't we? Oh, we focus on the negative and the bad things and the wrong things around us. But have you been blessed? Has God blessed you? Has God blessed you with a home? God blessed you with a family? We've seen so much to be thankful for. We seem to focus on what we don't have or what we could have been. My friend, aren't you thankful? That's part of the memorial, isn't it? He's coming here to be thankful, among other people who are thankful as well. A memorial. Some of us have been living like we haven't crossed over Jordan, I think, because we don't recognize the memorials of God's blessing all around us. We live in, in, in kind of a sadness, I think. Finally, one more memorial. I know it. That old preacher, he says one more point, and then he adds one more. I know how that works. Look here, one more memorial in verse 9 here in Joshua chapter 4. And Joshua, it says, set up 12 stones in the midst of the Jordan. You see, there was another memorial that was placed. In the midst of the Jordan, in the places where the feet of the priests, which bear the Ark of the Covenant, stood. And they are there unto this day. For the priests which bear the ark stood in the midst of the Jordan until everything was finished that the Lord commanded Joshua to speak unto all the people according to all that Moses commanded Joshua. And the people hasted and passed over. And it came to pass when all the people were clean passed over that the ark of the Lord passed over and the priests in the presence of the people. The priest and the ark of the covenant was held up as all the people walked through. And right at their feet, it says, they laid down 12 more stones. Right there in the midst of this Jordan water. Now, everybody's got an idea about what this second memorial was. I read through the commentaries. Everybody's got an idea. So I just looked through the commentaries, and I have to say, I, I think I see what, what the church has seen for many a millennia. This is a picture of Christ's death and resurrection for us here. A picture, a memorial before the memorial would occur. A picture of what Christ had done. You do know that Joshua's name is Jesus in Greek. Joshua's name is Jesus. There's a reason why in the New Testament, in the King James Version, they continually uh, uh, translate Hebrew names into Greek because it was originally written into Greek. For example, uh, you'll find Isaiah's name as Isaiah. When you see Jonas, uh, na Jonah's name, you'll see Jonas, right? That's the Greek word. And when you see Jesus, that's the Greek name for Joshua. Jesus' Hebrew name was Joshua. Some people pronounce it Yeshua today. I, I don't know, but it was Joshua is how we say that. So it says here that Joshua went down, places these 12 stones, one of the 12 stones, the people of God, into the river to be covered by the waters of death. For every place where no one will ever see them under that water. And on the outside, outside of the rivers of death, there are 12 stones, the people of God. Again, right? That's what that represents resurrected in the promised land for all to see forever identified with the land of israel you know you have an identification as well if you're here today and you've received jesus christ as your savior and you've brought him in you are forever identified as a christian right romans 6 1 through 4 gives us very clearly uh, as people were looking at the different Christians during that time, Paul said, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? 
God forbid. If you're a Christian, it's not your desire to continue in sin. God forbid. That's the last thing I'd want to happen. God forbid that that should occur. How shall we, he said, that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not. Now listen to this. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Now the Lord Jesus Christ in our time where we are today died over 2,000 years ago. And Paul is making it clear in this sixth chapter of Romans that we are identified in that death that he went through so long ago. That Greek, uh, that word there, bap, bap, baptize, is actually baptizo. It means, its primary meaning here has no connection with water. It's an idea of identification. It speaks of how Christ has come along in his death and he's covered over us. You know when we got baptized, that's how you come into the church, wasn't it? We come in, we got baptized. How many, we've all been baptized, I hope. But when you were baptized, the idea here is you were covered over in that death of Christ, and then you come out on the other side. You hear what I'm saying? You come out after that. That's why you're, once you're saved, then you go through that as a picture to the rest of the world. But it's not about the water. The idea is that when you were down there at that altar, wherever you were, and you were receiving Jesus as your Savior, you instantly become identified with his death. And now that death, all that sin that died upon that cross is gone in you. It's gone. You don't have no place in that. You're not identified with this world any longer. You've been separated from those things. And when he arose from the dead, then we arose from the dead. And we are joined together to a living Christ today. And that's why we're called the body of Christ. You understand that? That's why we're called the body of Christ. And we met here today. I was joined with him when I received him as my Savior. I showed the world when I was immersed in the river, me and my wife were both immersed a long time ago, and we were showing that God had immersed us. He had covered us over. He had shown his salvation to us, and we had been saved. Do you remember the day that all changed? Do you remember that? I, I'm of a mind that's what keeps people coming to church. I, you know, I know there are people who come to church every Sunday, and they go through some ritualistic manner, and that's just what they do because they never actually had an encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. They just come because, well, that's what I do on Sunday. And that's sad for them. It really is. It's sad. But you see, why I come to church, and why I hope you come to church every Sunday, is because Jesus got a hold of me a long time ago. He got a hold of me. He, he took me through those waters, not the baptismal waters, the cleansing waters of His Holy Spirit, he rubbed over my soul and he made me know, oh, I've gotten dirty. He had to come along as he did old Peter and wash my feet off. Probably my feet, my legs, and everything else because how nasty I get out in this world. But he cleans me off, don't he? Has he cleaned you off? Have you known that, that moment? Are you identified? Are you coming here today because it's a memorial of what Jesus done in your personal life one day when you bowed down and you said, Jesus... I can't do this. I need your salvation here today. I need you to save me. You have that memorial day that reminds you what Christ did for you. You know, I live in it every day. But Sunday's a special day for me. Can I tell you that? Sunday's a special day. It's a day when I get together together with the body of Christ and lift up Jesus. I have so missed seeing your faces. Even if they're behind uh, screens today. I'm going to look forward for us being inside. Your faces may be behind masks by then. I don't know, and that's okay. We'll talk about all that as we move forward. But friends, I tell you what, it's good to be among the people of God. Amen? Amen there. Amen? <laughs> Amen. Amen. Our God is good. Would you like to have that Memorial Day today? Some people are watching online. Some people here may never have known Jesus as your Savior and Lord. If you don't know Jesus as your Savior here today, I pray you'll just, just bow down. That's all it takes. Just bow down and say, Jesus, I want you to be my Savior. Jesus, I don't want to be like the rest of this world. I want to be identified with you. I don't want to be identified with the world anymore. I want to be set apart by you, Jesus. I want to receive your grace. I don't just want to get out of hell free card. I want to be with you forever card. That's what I'm looking for here today. Just ask him there. Maybe you're on the other side of the screen. Maybe you're there sitting in your car today. Just ask Jesus. Please. 
please save me. And I've never known one person that he, he asked that he did turn down. Have you? I've never known one to do that. You can have that Memorial Day. But maybe there's something here today that, that you just need to pray over. Something that's in your life right now. We can't take regular prayer requests here today. But maybe there's something. Maybe something was said here today has touched your heart. And you just need to be prayed about. You don't have to say it. God knows all about it. But if you'll just lift up your hand outside of your car right now. Is there something that you would like prayed about here today? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Each person. Anybody. Let's go to our Lord in prayer as we close out this service here today. Lord Jesus, we thank you. Lord God, I, I cried out to you all weekend saying, Lord, what are you going to do about this, this morning service? What are we going to do? Are we going to see the sun shine? Are we going to be able to do this? And Lord, you turned the sun on high. I'm breaking a sweat out here. <laughs> thank you, Jesus. Thank you for answering prayer. Thank you, Lord, for, for watching over our, our church family and our people here and, and keeping us safe through this crisis. Lord, thank you for answering prayers. I know you answer them. You hear our prayers when we ask. And I thank you for it. Lord, there are many hands that went up out here today. And Lord, there are many that are, are reaching out here online that, are, that are, 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 are speaking to us here today. I don't know. Some people may not comment it, but they're, they're, they're speaking here today. There's things upon their mind, their hearts, maybe when they watch this later. Lord, I pray you be with them. I pray you give them strength through this crisis, this trial, this trouble, this thing that they're bringing to your throne. And Lord, I pray that we'll just keep holding it up to you, saying, Jesus, this is what we need. This is what we think we need. Lord, if it ain't what we need, Lord, Lord take it away. But Lord, we see this. We have this, this desire. And as I come to my Father, I know he's not going to give me a snake or a rock. He'll give me bread. He'll give me something to eat. He'll give me what I need. I thank you, Jesus. I thank you for your blessings. I thank you for being able to preach from an old porch and lift you up across this whole interstate here today. Thank you, Lord, for your mercies, kindness, and love. In Jesus' blessed name, amen. Amen. It's good to be here, isn't it, folks? It's good to be here.